command. Be seated, please. It's great to have everyone here this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. We appreciate you choosing to come and worship God here at North Highlands. And uh, there's a card on the back of the pew in front of you. We'd love to have a a record of your visit with us. If you wouldn't mind filling that out and uh, giving it to one of us as uh, we leave this place. And again, uh, uh, like Floyd said, please stick around for a little while. Let us get to know you a little bit better and uh, let you know how much we appreciate you being here this morning. If you have your smartphone with you, you can follow along with the YouVersion app. And uh, maybe uh, then be able to reference this again later in the week for uh, a home Bible study. Um, We've got a lot going on, and we're looking forward to this coming Saturday. Of course, uh, we have the the men's leadership uh, workshop coming up on Saturday morning. At the same time, we'll be doing the food bank, and we're going to kind of incorporate that into uh, leadership. Of course, Jesus uh, taught us that leadership is uh, starts with service and serving others, and so we're just going to incorporate that right in, and uh, we encourage everyone that can to come and be a part of the, uh, the leadership workshop we're going to have, and, uh, and of course, serving our community through the food bank. I think it's a wonderful ministry, and it, it, it continues to let others in this community know that we care and uh, that we want to uh, serve in some way and be a part of their lives. And so come and be a part of that, especially if you haven't had the opportunity yet. This Saturday will be a great time to be here. We're going to have breakfast for the men uh, starting at uh, 8 o'clock that morning, and uh, then we'll have a a session with uh, Brother Rayburn and then uh, serve in the food bank and then have another uh, session with Brother Rayburn and lunch together before we end. And so we should be done with the, the men's uh, workshop by 1 o'clock. And uh, we'd really love to have uh, 100% of our men there. And we encourage you to take one of the postcards that we uh, printed in the foyer and take that to work with you or to school somewhere and, and give those to some others and invite them to come also. The things that he has to say and uh, will prove to be very uh, worthwhile to anyone who could be here. So. Uh, be here this Saturday for our workshop in leadership. <clears throat> um, this morning, I, I wanted to ask you the question, who watches out for you? Who is it that watches out for you? Is it your husband, maybe, or your wife, or maybe your brother or sister, or maybe it's a mother or father, but someone watches out for you, right? And you appreciate the fact that someone's there, that someone cares about you. Who do you depend on to tell you the truth? Or maybe uh, is anybody brave enough to tell you the truth, right? We have to kind of think about some of these thoughts and these ideas when we think about the fact that we have been commanded to speak the truth in love. You know, as Christians, we need the truth. And like Jesus said, the truth is what sets us free. And there in Ezekiel 33, we read together in verse 6, and I'd like to read uh, verse 1 through 6 with you. Uh, It says, Once again, this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, give your people this message. When I bring an army against a country, the people of that land choose one of their own to be a watchman. And when the watchman sees the enemy coming, he sounds the alarm to warn the people. If those who hear the alarm refuse to take action, it's their own fault if they die. They heard the alarm, but they ignored it, so the responsibility is theirs. If they had listened to the warning, they could have saved their lives. But if the watchman sees the enemy coming and doesn't sound the alarm to warn the people... He is responsible for their captivity. They will die in their sins, but I will hold the watchman responsible for their death. Here's a serious charge that God gives to his people Israel. He says, you set a watchman. And he tells them, uh, he goes on to say, you are the watchman. You are the one. And Christians, I would suggest that today we are the watchmen. We are to be watching and we are to sound the warning for what is to come to those who reject the offer that Jesus has given to each person, the death, the burial, the, the, the resurrection that he has gone through for us to deliver us from sin. You see, this is God's expectation of a watchman or a watchwoman, if you will. We are all to be watchmen. And this is a person who's watching out for another person or other people. And Christian, you are called to be a watchman. As Christians, we're to look out for one another. You're my watchman and I'm your watchman. And we must warn each other if 
we see things getting out of control in our lives. When we know one another, when we care about one another, we would speak up and say, hey, you've got to stop doing this. It's, it's hurting you. It's hurting someone else. You, you've got to control yourself, right? Uh, we say these things to one another to encourage and to help. And we've hopefully had someone say these things to us if we've ever gotten out of control because someone has your best interest at heart, right? Someone cares about you. They care enough to say, hey, I'm a little concerned about what's happening here. Keep your eyes open. Don't be fooled, maybe. There's so many different things that could be said by a watchman who's coming into your life to love you, to hold you accountable, because in a loving relationship, there is accountability. And this morning, I want to encourage you to speak the truth in love to one another. Valentine's Day, of course, is Tuesday this week. Just a reminder, all you guys, all right? It's Tuesday, <clears throat> and what a great time to, to just say, you know what, I, I want this Valentine's Day to uh, be spiritually impacting on this relationship. And so we're going to have a truly loving conversation about some things that maybe we could do better and help one another uh, to get closer to each other, to get, get closer to God, to grow spiritually as we should. There in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, this is where the, the Holy Spirit gives us this, this statement. And it's in a passage of Scripture that's talking about the growth of the church. It's talking about how the church uh, is to be uh, working together, how the church is to help one another, and how the church is to, to help one another as we grow. It says, speaking the truth in love, so you may grow up in all things into him who is the head, and that's Christ. And it's from whom, from Christ, the whole body is joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. And this causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. He says, it's by what you give. It's by what you say. It's how you build one another up that causes the body to grow, that helps the body to be strong. And so if you're remaining silent, like that watchman that we were just reading about in Ezekiel 33, if someone is remaining silent, even though they're a part of a body, a community, a church of people, if that person's remaining silent, what does God say about that? He says he's going to be held responsible. We're going to be held responsible for our silence, for our neglect to say the things that need to be said. And so my encouragement to you this morning is to speak up, to speak the truth, and to speak that truth with love. And let's try to understand the importance of speaking the truth in love this morning. So often when we decide it's time to speak the truth in love, we've got to examine ourselves, right? We've got to see, am I going at this the right way? Am I helping the situation or am I hurting it? Is this something that I'm doing out of, out of the wrong reason or am I really hoping to help the person who I want to speak to? Why am I deciding to address this issue right now? Is it possibly that I'm annoyed with that person? Is it possibly uh, that I see their soul in jeopardy, but that's not the real catalyst behind my movement? But really, I'm just annoyed. I'm tired of putting up with this, and so I'm finally going to say, have I finally given in to what I should have done in the beginning and spoken up for truth? Because I want to help the situation. I don't want to just be annoyed. I don't want just to, to tolerate something like our society says. Just tolerate no, I want to love. I want to have a higher standard than just tolerating someone. I want to love them. So am I, am I going about it the right way? Remember in 1 Corinthians 13, it tells us that love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. It doesn't parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, right? And so as I approach someone who I love, someone who I am to be a watchman for, am I approaching them in love? Am I doing it for the right reasons? Am I doing it because I'm angry? Because that's a possibility too, isn't it? Uh, that we just get fed up and we're so angry with someone uh, that we just unleash truth into their life and yet that truth is given in such a way that it's, it's not going to do any good because all it's going to do is it's going to provoke more anger. 
And, and when we allow our anger to take over and our anger to, to try to inflict truth rather than lovingly deliver truth, to speak truth into someone's life, it's just not going to turn out right. In Colossians 3, 8, it says, But now you yourselves are, put, are to put off these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Proverbs 15 and verse 18 says, A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays contention. And James 1, 20 tells us that the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so if I go to someone who I'm supposed to be a watchman for and I deliver the message in an angry tone in a way that they can't receive it, what good have I done? No good. In fact, I've probably even made the situation worse. Am I helping or am I hurting? And sometimes we're afraid. We allow fear to fill us up. And we're so afraid. And maybe it's that we have such concern for this loved one. Maybe we... we we just don't want them to throw their lives away. And so we, we have all this fear pent up. And so when we go to them, we speak to them in such a way that doesn't come across as, as a watchman, but rather as someone who's afraid, as someone who doesn't necessarily care for them, but is afraid for the impact of their behavior on me. In Galatians 4 and verse 11, Paul had this sentiment as he spoke to the Galatians. He said, I am afraid for you lest I have labored for you in vain. But remember in 1 John 4 and verse 18, the Holy Spirit tells us that there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So we need to squash that fear. And what we need to do is embrace the confidence of Jesus Christ and the fact that our Savior was one who would speak the truth and he would do it with love. He would say, go and sin no more. But when did he say it? He'd say that after he had met needs of people who were, yeah, they were in sin. But he would meet their needs. He would find a way to show them his heart and his concern for their soul. And then he would be able to say, he would be qualified in their minds to say, now go and sin no more. Stop doing it, what you're doing. Start doing the things you should be doing. There's freedom in the truth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, it says, Even if I made you sorry with my letter, I don't regret it. He says, I've written you a letter. I know that it made you sorry. I know that what I said convicted you. I know that what I said might have made you cry. I know that it hurt your feelings to hear what I had to say. But notice what he says. But I don't regret it, though I did regret it. He says, For I perceive that the same letter made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world, it produces death. He says, I, I did regret it. I didn't want to have to say these things. I, I didn't want to have to go through this conversation but now that we're on the other side of it, I see what God has done with that conversation, and I'm so glad I spoke up. I'm so glad we talked about this. And yeah, it produced tears, and it, it produced hurt, and it was a hard conversation to have, but now I see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Repentance, change, improvement from the condition that you were once in. Christians, this should be our desire. It should be our desire to have these kind of conversations with others, that they might know that we care, that we, they might know that we love them, that we want to help deliver them from the captivity of sin, from the captivity of falsehood into the freedom of Christ. As he promised us in John 8, 32, the truth shall make you free. So are you helping or hurting? Remember, as we consider this, what we've read in Ezekiel 33, the fact is, we can be hurting by our silence, by just not saying anything, by looking at a loved person who, who may be making some bad decisions and just thinking, well, if I say something now, it'll be this or it'll be that or, or whatever con concepts that we come up with in our minds to excuse us from speaking up. But we need to speak up. We need to express our love and our concern to those who are struggling. <clears throat> This is uh, a man named Ricky Jackson. Ricky Jackson was convicted of murder 
in 1975. He was standing in front of a drugstore in Ohio. And there was a witness. He was a 12-year-old boy. He was on a, on a bus, a city bus, passing by when the murder took place. And when he came to the, to, to the lineup, he picked Ricky Jackson out of the lineup. Now, there was uh, plenty of evidence at the time, and it was all boxed up, but they had an eyewitness. They closed the case. Ricky Jackson was convicted of murder, and he spent 39 years in prison. But he always claimed he was innocent. Someone listened. They started checking out the evidence, and they realized there was DNA evidence. Back, back in 1975, they couldn't have known this. They couldn't have checked the DNA. But in 2014, Ricky Jackson had served the longest sentence in the United States as an innocent man, and he was proven innocent in 2014. And he was released by the state of Ohio. And they paid him back as much as they possibly could for what they had done in wrongly convicting him because he had never even been a part of the murder. He had nothing to do with it. <clears throat> and he was exonerated 39 years later. 39 years of this man's life that was taken from him. And yeah, it was because someone made a mistake. Someone picked him rather than saying, I'm really not sure. Rather than saying what was true and letting it be known that they didn't know. It was only a few months later that the one, the eyewitness who had put him in prison, only a few months before he recanted his whole story and said he was wrong and he really couldn't tell. But if he had just said it at the beginning, right? If he had just spoken the truth, at the beginning. Ricky Jackson never would have spent that 39 years. He never would have lost so much of his life to being incarcerated. Now, friends, I, I want to remind you that, that we live in a world where people are incarcerated in sin, where people are, are imprisoned in their own choices, in the bad decisions that they've made. People are imprisoned, and they're in this prison that they've designed themselves of bad mistakes. And the fact is, some of us sitting in this room right now are experiencing a prison from our own decisions. And not like Ricky Jackson in the fact that he was innocent of his crime, but we, we're actually guilty of the things that we've done. And Jesus Christ, he comes into the world and he pays the debt for the things that we've done, for the things that we've thought, for the terrible things that we've said to one another. He pays that price so that no judge can ever convict us. No judge can ever lock us up for eternity. Rather, the judge will rejoice in setting us free because of the truth that we received from Jesus Christ. I want to ask you, is there someone you could be setting free? Is there someone who's, who's imprisoned by their own sin, who's imprisoned by bad decisions, who you know, who you have a relationship with, who you love, someone maybe even in your family that you could have influence on, that you could speak truth to? And it might be uncomfortable. It might be a truth to say, you know what? I'm scared that you're going to burn in hell. I'm scared that you're, you're going to mess up our family. I'm scared that somehow these decisions that you've made, they're going to impact our children. Uh, they're going to impact other people's children because they look at you and they see that you seem to be fine, but we know what's happening. Is it something that you need to speak up about? Is there someone that you need to speak to with love and concern that you need to be the watchman for? Ricky Jackson's watchman didn't show up for 39 years but he finally showed up he finally showed up and that picture that you see up there one from 1975 and one from 2014 when he was sitting in the courtroom and he was told you're going to be set free because we know you didn't do it that's him looking up and who do you think he's thinking who do you think he's praising when he looks up Looking at a ceiling, but he knows what's beyond the ceiling, doesn't he? Praising his God. Because glory is given to God when truth is spoken. Glory is given to God when prisoners are set free. Glory is given to God when chains are broken that have kept us from doing what is right. But you know, none of that can happen until a watchman shows up and speaks life, speaks truth, and speaks it in love. 
So Christian, how? How are we going to speak the truth in love? In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, I think this passage should be one that, that maybe stays on our mind. Maybe one that, uh, that, that we should uh, create a screensaver for, right? And put it on the front of our phone so it's always there in front of us uh, on our computer so that we see it day in and day out. Maybe uh, right there beside our door as we leave our home. What a wonderful passage to keep on our minds as we go into a world of, uh, filled with people who are incarcerated, who are trapped, who are imprisoned, who are chained with sin. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Holy Spirit says you speak the truth in love. You make sure that as you speak, you speak it in a way that people can accept the truth with grace, seasoned with salt, and have an understanding of how you ought to answer each one. Each one, because each one is different, right? Each person, each personality, each conflict, each situation, each one is different. And so prepare your hearts and your minds to carry the message of Jesus, the truth, in love. And these are powerful words that can change lives. Now, there's different personalities, and they require different approaches as we speak truth in love. Sometimes we, we need to confront others. There's a confrontation that can take place. And you know, this is the kind of, uh, of approach that can really only work when someone has no doubt that you love them. When you, when you go to a brother, when you go to a sister, when you go to someone who's very close to you, that you have no doubt about the love that exists between the two of you, you can confront. You can confront uh, in a way that points out their sin and, and helps them to turn from that sin. Remember in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, uh, there the Holy Spirit records for us how that Paul confronted Peter. Both apostles, both servants of God, both men of God, uh, both dedicated their lives to Jesus, and yet Peter had made a mistake. He had become racist. He had been a bigot. And what did Paul do? It says, when, I, when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. And then he explains, because he wouldn't hang out with, with the Gentiles if the Jews were around, but if the Jews weren't around, then he, he wouldn't mind being around them. But he played the hypocrite. He played a bigot. And Paul confronted him to his face. Because they had a relationship, that confrontation was required. And Paul was a man of God, a watchman for the soul of Peter, who didn't want him to lose what Jesus had died for. I think about Acts 2, verse 36. Here's a, a group of, of Jewish men, part of the family. And their family members standing around them, the nation of Israel, are, are gathered here. And, and this amazing thing has happened, and, and they've preached to them about Jesus. And Peter has explained why there was a, a great noise and why it, it looks like there's flames over their heads. And he's explained this to these people. And he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, who you crucified, Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, men and brethren, because they literally were related. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And of course, then Peter, in love, told him, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He spoke the truth in love, but he did it in a confrontational way because of the relationship he had, because of your relationship with someone, you could confront them with the truth. Or maybe you need to use the uh, approach of an invitation. In Isaiah 55 and verse 3, uh, there we read, Incline your ear and come to hear me. Hear and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. He says, listen, I need to invite you into something. I need to invite you to a new understanding. I want to invite you to, to change the view that you're living through. There in verses 6 through 9, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man forsake those thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and God will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God says, you try me. You just try me. You try me. You do your part. You be the watchman that I've commissioned you to be, that I've commanded you to be. You be that watchman, and you just watch if I don't do my part also. Because he will. He will. He'll be there, and he'll strengthen, and he'll help. And through the repentance, he will bring salvation. In Isaiah 55 and verse 11, it says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It will accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God says, you speak my words. You invite someone to hear the words of God, that their heart can be changed, that their mind can be changed, that they can repent and turn from the way of unrighteousness into the way of righteousness, that they can follow Jesus Christ. Invite them. Invite them to see what God can do in their life. Invite them to take part in all that Jesus has in store for them. Maybe the approach you should use is a conversational one. Maybe it's something uh, that just, you know, over lunch you can sit down and, and just have a conversation with someone. You know, I, I noticed this about you, or I, I wanted to talk to you about this. I, I feel like I have to point this out because I love you. You know, this, this easy conversation that you have with loved ones all the time. In Acts 22 and verse 14, Paul is having a, a conversation with a follower of Christ. And listen to what Ananias says to him. He says in verse 14 of Acts 22, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. This is a conversation between a person who believes in Jesus and a person who doesn't believe in Jesus or didn't. But because of the conversation that this person had with them, it changed their minds. It brought them to a place where they were ready and willing and did obey what Jesus said. In Acts 26, we have another conversation, and this is the man who had been uh, taught by Ananias, the one who was receiving those words, the one who was baptized and called on the name of the Lord right then in Acts 22. In Acts 26, now he's the one having the conversation. And his reputation is well known. They know he's a scholar. They know he knows the book. And so he has authority as he speaks about the things that he speaks about to the king. And he said, I'm not mad. In, in Acts 26, 25, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I speak freely knows all these things, and I'm convinced that none of these things have escaped his attention since this was not done in a corner, speaking about Jesus. And King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might both become almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. It's a conversation. And no, it doesn't end the way that we would love for it to end, that God wants it to end. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And yet, he says, you almost persuaded me. This conversation was important. He, he gives confirmation that the conversation was good and was real and was needed because the truth was delivered in love. And maybe it's something that we need to demonstrate, but all too often, Christians, we just let this demonstration technique or this, this avenue of, of spreading the truth be a crutch, don't we? We say, well, I, I, I'm doing the things I should. I, I don't know how to vocalize them. I don't know how to say them. But you do. You can say what Jesus has done for you. You can tell someone how, how lost you were and how saved you are and the change that occurred in your life. And that's all you really need to know. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, what a beautiful passage. He says, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we don't lose heart. We've renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or handling, handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel is veiled, 
If it's hidden, if it's kept silent, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we don't preach ourselves. We preach Jesus Christ, the Lord, and ourselves, the servants of Jesus. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He says, it's not about me. It's about the message of Jesus. And it's about delivering that message. And if we're silent, who's going to speak up? If the watchman remains silent, if the watchman doesn't warn, if the watchman doesn't care enough about the people entrusted to him through his influence in the community, through his influence in his family, who is? No, it's us. There's no doubt, Christian, that it is our responsibility. If you showed up at the hospital <clears throat> because you had broken your arm, and there was no doubt your arm was broken, you can look at it and you can tell, my arm is broken, right? And you show up at the hospital, at the, at the ER, and you walk in there and the doctor looks at that and, and he goes back and he talks to the nurse and he's like, man, if I tell him his arm's broken, it's going to upset him so bad. I don't know how he'll react. I think what we'll do is shoot him up with morphine and send him home. So the doctor comes back in, and you say, it's broke, right, doc? No, nah, you'll be fine. You'll be all right. He shoots you up with morphine and sends you home with a broken bone. What's it going to do? It's going to get worse, right? It's only going to cause more problems. It's only going to eventually kill you, Right? If we don't set it right, if we don't heal, if we don't repair, if we don't get in there and, and do the things that need to be done to bring about healing, we would call that malpractice, wouldn't we? Church, it's spiritual malpractice to remain silent. It's spiritual malpractice to look at someone who is suffering the effects of their sin and not say, hey, stop sinning, and then you won't have to suffer that effect any longer. It's malpractice to say, oh, you'll be all right. God bless you. Bless your heart and push them out the door. It's spiritual malpractice. And too often, Christians are guilty of spiritual malpractice. In Jeremiah 5 and verse 30, it says, An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests, they rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? That's a haunting question. But what will you do in the end? This is a question asked by God Almighty himself. But what will you do in the end if you don't speak up, watchman? What will you do in the end if you prophesy falsely? If you're the one in the family who's supposed to know what is right and wrong, if you're the one in the family that everyone looks to to handle the Scripture, to, to deliver the, the Scripture, and to, to help someone, you're the one that they think of as spiritual it's malpractice not to tell the truth and to help that person overcome whatever it is that's tripping them up in James 5 19 he says brethren if anyone among you wonders from the truth and someone turns him back let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins everyone is a watchman for someone who will you deliver today? Who will you be uh, willing to put yourself out there for? Who do you love enough to say you're wrong? Who do you love enough to, to beg that they would come to Jesus? You know, usually it's the person or the people that you love the most, isn't it? How will you watch for their souls? Will you be a watchman that the Lord is proud of? or one that the Lord condemns because of his silence? How will you extend the truth to them in love? I want to ask you a question, and it's one that I encourage you just to think about this week. One that I hope will spur us into action. Have you committed spiritual malpractice? Are you that doctor that just gave some morphine to a wound that needed help? Change. Let's change. Let's do better.
<clears throat> if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we encourage you to become a Christian. We want to speak the truth in love. The truth is, without Jesus Christ, you'll lose your soul. Without Jesus Christ and his redeeming blood, you'll stand before a judge someday. And that judge won't be able to overlook your sin because it will have never been pardoned through Jesus' blood. But if you come to Jesus, if you repent, if you're immersed for the forgiveness of your sins, if you rise up out of that watery grave just as Christ rose out of his grave to a new life, to a Christian life, you can walk in truth. And that judge someday, he's actually your father. Your father who wants to be with you forever. So repent. Be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you are a Christian, but you know you've been silent when you should have spoke up. If you know that you, you have those who you need help teaching, let this church know. Let us help you. Get someone who is better at speaking words to go with you. That's fine. But go. Be the watchman God has called you to be. If you have any need, won't you come while we stand and we sing this song? I was curious about the flowers, so I thought you might be awesome. Um, in remembrance of Doris Holbatter from Elmer Tate. 